Hello, everyone, and Juma Mubaraka. Welcome to today's session. Uh, we're very excited to have you with us. So I am uh, Emira, the Education USA Advisor for Libya, and I'm glad to have with us today Mr. Rashad, the Senior International Admissions Counselor from University of California, Irvine, Elizabeth, the Assistant Director of International Recruitment um, and Enrollment from Minnesota State University, Ms. Tara, the Director of International Admissions, and Ms. Karen, the Assistant Director of International Admissions Operations from Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University. Mr. Christopher, the International Admissions uh, Manager from Orange Coast College, and Mr. Youssef, the Assistant Director of Admissions from Northwestern University in Qatar. Our guest speakers will walk you through the different types of U.S. higher education institutions, so make sure to prepare your burning questions. You can type them here or in the chat, uh, chat or comment box, and we'll make sure to answer all of them at the end of the presentation. But before we do so, I would like to start with an introduction about our network, Education USA. So who we are and how can we help you? So as Education USA is a US Department of State network of over 430 international student advising centers in more than 175 countries and territories. The network promotes US higher education to students around the world by offering accurate, comprehensive, and current information about opportunities to study at accredited post-secondary institutions in the United States. So Education USA also provides services to the US higher education community to help institutional leaders meet their recruitment and campus interna interna internationalization goals. Now, how can we help you and what are the services that we offer for you? Number one, we offer free public info sessions. So these info sessions, they could be about the five steps to study in the United States, or they could be about other topics that would be like really important for you and help you with your application process. Number two, we do some chat sessions with university representatives, just like today's session, so, so that you can interact with the university reps and ask your questions and learn more about maybe the application process or even the types of the U.S. institutions, financial aid opportunities, scholarships opportunities, and so on and so forth. And we also do some sessions with Libyan alumni um, who studied in the United States in which they could, you know, share their um, experiences with you, and that could be one of you one day. Number three, we offer free individual consultations. So if you are um, a student, if you are a parent, a teacher, a professor, and you want to e-connect with me and get more details about the application process or even studying in the United States in general, these are my contact info. You can reach out to me by WhatsApp or just send me an email. And I highly encourage you to follow us on social media uh, to find all of our upcoming events and opportunities. So make sure to type Education USA Libya on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And last but not least, this is the official website of our network in general, educationusa.state.gov. So you can go to this website, you can explore the five steps, or you can find your advising center if you are following us from a different country today. You can um, explore the financial aid opportunities available there, and you can also um, take a look at the events that are taking place uh, in different Education USA centers. So again, welcome everyone. Now I'll turn it over to our guest speaker and we'll start with Elizabeth. Make sure to type your questions and enjoy the session. Thank you so much for that introduction, Amira. Hi, everyone, and welcome. Good afternoon, good evening, good morning from wherever you may be joining us. We are so excited to have you part of this session today, and we're very excited to partner with Education USA Libya to present to all of you. So all of us here are admission counselors. We work with international students coming to the United States, and we certainly understand how overwhelming it can be when thinking about applying to higher education in the US. So our goal from this presentation today is to help you lay a foundation of best uh, tips for finding the right fit for you when studying in the United States. We hope to help narrow down the process um, and help you consider different aspects of US higher education and ultimately help you achieve your higher education goals. 
So like Amira said, um, you can type your questions into the chat on Facebook Live or if you're in Zoom, into the Zoom chat and we'll be happy to help answer those questions at the end. Um, but just very quickly before we do that, I will let my colleagues introduce themselves. Again, my name is Elizabeth Lorenz and I am the Assistant Director at Minnesota State University Mankato. Welcome. Over to you, Yusef. Hello, everyone. My name is Yusef, and I'm uh, the Assistant Director of, uh, of Admissions uh, at Northwestern University Branch Campus in, in Qatar. Thank you for joining us, and thank you to Education USA. To you, Tara. I think Tara is unable to unmute herself. We'll move maybe to Rashad. Hello, my name is Rashad Howe, Senior International Admissions Counselor at University of California, Irvine. Uh, thanks for being here with us today. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tara Good. I'm the Director of International Admissions at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, and I'm also joined by my colleague, Karen, if she can unmute herself and introduce herself. Hi, uh, yeah, I'm Karen Crichton, and I'm Assistant Director of International Admissions here at Daytona Beach, Florida. Hello, everybody. Great. And we have two colleagues as well, Christopher Trebio and Scott McClama. They're part of our Global Six team. Um, they're not able to join us today, but they are also both representing the West Coast, along with Rashad, Rashad at Orange Coast College and Pepperdine University. So when um, thinking about applying to the US, something that a lot of students don't realize is there are more than 4,000 colleges, universities, and institutes of higher education in the United States. So again, we know that can be a very long list to narrow down when picking your top choices that are the best fit for you. So we'll spend some time today identifying different aspects of what you should consider when applying to different types of institutions, we'll talk about the application process and curriculum at a few different types of institutions in the United States. And we'll also talk about some of the, app, the basic application processes as well, and thinking about um, different application deadlines and different types of admission review. So a few of the different types of colleges um, you see here are, are some of the most common institutions that you'll find in the United States. That includes institutes such as liberal arts colleges, research universities, community colleges or two-year institutions, art conservatories, institutes of technology, and HBCUs, also known as historically black colleges and universities. One other thing that we think about as well is class size. Um, so if you think about the class size uh, of, say, the uh, high school that you uh, may have come uh, from uh, or applying to when you're leaving uh, your high school experience and going to college, uh, a lot of students want to have a, a kind of a similar experience. Uh, so if you went to a high school with uh, about 20 students or 15 students, then you may want some of the same kinds of uh, experiences. However, re definitely recognize that college is very, very different. This might not be the experience. You might um, want to go to a college that has your major, but maybe you might end up going to a, um, a, a college that has a class size or an average class size of uh, 25 or 30 or, or a lot more. Uh, so definitely this should uh, this should be something that you're taking under consideration. Many students uh, report that uh, or it's pretty um, widely recognized that a lower class size is something that students want. Uh, it's a uh, determinant of success in many uh, in many cases. Uh, but definitely you want to take this under consideration um, when you are taking a look at the different courses, the classes, the university that you want to uh, attend at the, uh, the collegiate or university level uh, so that you'll be able to uh, have a good, um, a good uh, clear idea of exactly the kinds of uh, experience that you're going to be having. Another factor that you that students look at if they want to study at U.S. institution is the location. So uh, in the United States, there are more than 4,000 institutions. A lot of these institutions, um, are not the majority though, but um, there's a, a good number of institutions that actually also 
we'd have branches outside the United States. So do consider that uh, because, uh, for example, a great example that we have today is Northwestern University, their campus in Qatar. Um, so location is very important with looking at um, studying at uh, US institutions. Uh, for example, if you are uh, looking at studying at US institution and you are coming from Asia, for example, or coming from suburban or urban uh, kind of uh, uh, like a city. So there are a lot of questions related to location that you need to look at. Do I wanna be, do I wanna study in a, uh, an institution that is located in an area that is cold? Uh, there is a, do I want to be in a city? Do I wanna be, uh, so these are all questions you need to ask when looking at the location at of that institution because um, you could think that institution is in the city when, uh, when, when, when you, and when you get there, you, you may, you may find that you need probably some sort of transportation. You may want to ask well, what kind of transportation, how accessible that transportation is. If, is, if I want to go to the city, if I want to, uh, or, or if I want to live off campus, for example. So these are, uh, this is what we mean by location and and. Uh, by location also, uh, the weather factor, the, the campus and, and, and the accessibility and how accessible you would be to different resources um, uh, outside uh, the, the, the campus. Uh, so that's very important. And I will hand it over to my colleague to talk about the cost and value. So hi, everyone. I'm sure that um, if you have considered studying outside your home country, you've probably also considered uh, the cost of what it would mean to study um, outside of your home country, maybe in the United States. Um, but certainly something to consider when you are looking at the cost of institutions in the United States is also the value, right? Um, so what that means is, um, I'm sure you've heard the terms um, return on investment. Um, so certainly when you are looking at studying in the United States, the cost may seem daunting at first, um, but ultimately you really need to explore the opportunities that come with the cost. Um, there, there is something really amazing about um, an education wherever you do decide to study. And, and someone once said, a fellow counselor of ours once said, education is something um, that no one can ever take away from you. Um, that's what really makes education uh, unique and valuable. Um, so when you are considering the cost, um, there certainly are so many factors to keep in mind. Um, and I do believe we will touch on scholarship opportunities. Um, I know that these, um, you know, ideas go hand in hand. So uh, we'll also be able to talk about scholarship opportunities for you and be able to field questions at the end of this presentation in regards to cost, value, scholarships, etc. So uh, next, next you kind of want to also uh, kind of take a look at the, the programs that are offered at the college or university. So um, if you have, um, if you're looking to go into say biology uh, or organic chem chemistry, like this fine gentleman is looking to go into, you can see the book that he's carrying, but um, you want to make sure that, um, you know, some of the programs that you're going to be looking for is going to be represented at that college university. Uh, you also want to look at the, uh, the university university's reputation for those uh, kinds of, um, of science courses. So if you are someone who wants to do um, uh, technological research or, um, and development, then maybe you want to go to a college that's like MIT or something like, or Institute of Technology, uh, where some of those opportunities are going to be very strong uh, and abundant. So you want to uh, you want to make sure that, that you're researching the, the programs at a specific university. Uh, many colleges and universities have great um, foundational um, uh, types of programs. Um, you know, like biology is one that many university had university have. Uh, business is another uh, in some way, shape, or form. So uh, you definitely want to investigate uh, the different courses that uh, a college has, and making sure that you're selecting one that's going to fit your needs. The next aspect to consider is student equity support. In the US, we believe that all students should have equal opportunity and access to education. And in higher education, we support all the students who enroll on our campus through various student support services. So when you come to the United States um, and study at 
uh, any institution, whether it's a community college or a research university or a liberal arts college or institute of technology, for example, you'll find that there are various student support service offices on campus to help you with your academics, as well as support you holistically as a person. So on our campuses, just as an example, there are services such as the International Center that works specifically with international students who are studying on our campuses. Um, and support you with your, your academics and your visa um, related questions. There's also counseling centers on campus to help students um, holistically be, be better themselves as they are studying in their academics. And there's other support service offices as well, such as um, student uh, government, women's centers on campus, LGBT centers, and other um, student uh, government opportunities and resources. So when you go to a campus or when you're researching your opportunities, make sure you're looking at the student support services that are available, because not only do we want you to be successful in the classroom, but we also want you to be successful as a whole person outside of the classroom as well. Uh, so now that takes us to selectivity. So um, many uh, students uh, um, sometimes uh, are, it's kind of a uh, an area where some students get a little bit nervous because maybe they want to go to a college that's uh, that's highly selective or, or things like that. So let's kind of talk about the idea of selectivity, which kind of goes hand in hand with ranking. Uh, which we'll cover on the next slide as well. Uh, but uh, selectivity is merely the amount of students that the university selects for admission. Um, so if there is a, a college that gets uh, 100 uh, applications, but they only accept maybe 30 of them, then that means that their selectivity uh, for that particular year is 30%. All right, so um, colleges and universities use selectivity to kind of build uh, the class based on uh, the amount of students who uh, obviously apply, the strength of those students uh, in comparison to the other students who were applying at that university. So if you want to go to a highly selective school, uh, then you know you have to take under consideration that um, that you have to take a look at number one, the selectivity, some of the things, some of the things that the college or university is going to be taking a look at when deciding this um, to when deciding to select students. Um, because uh, you may also want to take under consideration selectivity within a major. We've talked about you know majors and programs and things like that, but some some colleges and universities are very strong. Uh, like I said, in some uh, like say biology or business, um, but they so they might end up being more selective in some of those stronger majors. So you definitely have do have to take under consideration selectivity when you are uh, taking a look at colleges. Uh, again. Selectivity kind of goes hand in hand with ranking, so I'll uh, leave that to our next colleague to talk about uh, ranking a bit. Thanks, Rashad. So another term that you will come across when learning about the education system in the United States or trying to find the right college for yourself is ranking. So you will hear that uh, this institution is ranked top one in the United States or top three or top 10 or top 100 in the whole world. Uh, but what you should know, these rankings, they have to be understood first. So the ranking is don't look only at the ranking of the institution as a whole. You could be looking, you could look also at the ranking of the certain um, degree or the program that um, that institution is is actually uh, is actually um, the, the evaluated evaluated for, for example. So uh, ranking uh, here uh, also can be referred to a certain uh, aspect of that institution. For example, rank top uh, three in terms of like. Uh, accessibility in terms of like environment, in terms of a lot of things. But uh, the ranking can be very helpful, of course, because uh, it does help students uh, when looking at, uh, to, to, to make a difference between different institutions. It also helps like highlight where that institution is actually could be pretty good um, compared to others. However, uh, it is it is very uh, important and we are he all here representatives of colleges and we uh, because there are students that they say like, all right, I'm going to go to this institution because it's rank, uh, ranked uh, 10 in the United States or rank 
number 10 in the whole world. And then they tend to go there and, and they, they never successful. They, they don't succeed. They don't. So it's not about ranking. It's about actually uh, finding the right fit and finding where you could be successful, where you could be happy and uh, achieve uh, all the uh, your academic goals. Uh, so you can be a great, uh, well prepared for after you graduate. So that's very important here. Uh, and, and there are also resources available because there are some websites that would give this institution rank top something and the other one will be totally different than the other website. There are some websites or, or organization that would rank institutions and not mention other institutions. So, so don't rely on only like couple and also rely of course on those that's trustworthy resources. Um, they're they're uh, especially useful, as I said, for finding colleges that aren't included in the national university section. Uh, but again, it is important to take the rankings with the uh, carefully, or as we say, with a grain of salt. Um, don't believe that one college is better than another one. Um, we're all here, highly selective, highly uh, ranked, uh, nationally and also internationally but keep that in mind it's very important uh to the next slide all right uh here to talk to you again about uh, a, a little bit more uh, information about uh, the community college system in the united states so uh the community college system is uh, something that a lot of international students are starting to uh, see that is can be a very good resource for them so what are community colleges? Uh, community colleges are an open um, platform or university um, uh, for students to be able to attend in the United States um, after uh, they, uh, they graduate from uh, their secondary school or high school. Uh, so sometimes students um, either do not um, have the opportunity to go to a, a traditional four-year institution, and so they end up going to a community college. These are uh, very, very much accredited um, um, institutions where, where they're in able to, students are able to take uh, up to two years at uh, the community college and then take the courses that they've, that they've taken at this community college uh, and then go to uh, a traditional uh, four-year institution. So um, all around the United States, there are these community colleges um, in many cities, many um, many states, uh, and and so most of the time, the courses that you're going to be able to take at, uh, say, like a Florida uh, community college, is going to transfer to Florida universities as well. Um, so if you know that you want to, if you're a domestic student and you know you want to go to a college, then you can use that as an avenue. However, as a um, as a international student, you also have the opportunity to attend community colleges too. Uh, now, why would you, as an international student, want to attend a community college? Um, so if you know that you want to go to school again, say in, in California, however, you don't have like say the, the strength in your grades, you can attend a, a California uh, community college and then take those credits and go to a California school like University of California, Irvine. The uh, opportunities that uh, community colleges afford is very low tuition in comparison to some of the other uh, uh, colleges and universities. Uh, and then uh, just the, the ability to have some of the same kinds of um, opportunities, some of the same majors, uh, some of the same uh, support systems as like say community, say uh, international students are afforded at four, traditional four-year institutions. Uh, and then they can, again, transfer those, um, those uh, credits into a four-year institution uh, for like to, so that they can get a bachelor's degree and then go on to uh, say getting a master's degree or take other opportunities um, to do maybe optional practical training uh, where they can actually get a job at a, um, at a US um, uh, business and be able to um, maybe do that for a year or so, uh, and then maybe go on to like their master's degree. So uh, generally in university, you kind of have to take two years of what we call general uh, courses um, and then try and then go on to some of your uh, courses that you would take for your major like business or like biology. Um, and then you um, 
at that point, again, you'll be able to kind of to take this two plus two uh, formula for you to be able to get your bachelor's degree. Uh, so this is definitely something that is uh, available to you. Um, one of our colleges here, Orange Coast College, um, here um, is going to, um, uh, you have to have that opportunity to learn a little bit more about Orange Coast College. Uh, so with that, I'll move it to my next colleague here. Okay, so one of the other things that really makes studying in the United States um, unique is that we do have lots of specialized institutions. Um, and by specialized institutions, um, in this case, we are referring to STEM focused um, institutions. And I'm, I'm sure that um, probably everyone knows um, STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and math, but I just think it's worth uh, um, just mentioning that um, STEM focused universities are focused on technical um, and skills based curriculums. So we're really looking at institutions um, that focus in on, on a specific area. Um, and so if you are interested in the engineering disciplines, um, uh, in, in the case of every riddle, if you're interested in aviation or aerospace, um, uh, if you're interested in math, um, there's certainly opportunities in the United States to choose a specialized institution. Um, and the interesting thing about choosing a specialized institution is that um, you'll find that the labs and facilities on the campuses of a specialized institution um, are really unique um, and may not be offered um, at institutions. Um, that may not have that, um, that niche um, area of interest and study. So I think that's really what makes specialized institutions um, unique in the United States. Um, just to give you an idea of um, what we're talking about with specialized institutions, I'm sure you've all heard of Purdue. Um, I'm sure you've heard of Georgia Tech. Um, also, um, you know, just do Doing a quick search myself, um, just out of curiosity, if, if you look up um, specialized STEM institutions in the US, um, things that will come up are um, institutes of technology, and there are multiple institutes of technology, right? So Massachusetts Institute of Technology, California Institute of Technology, um, and also the term polytechnic is something you'll find when you search these terms as well. So, you know, I think What's interesting and what we're trying to um, give you a, a, a top level overview is that um, the, the entire university process in the United States is quite complicated and it might seem a bit overwhelming at first and doing Google searches can even be overwhelming when you start because there's so much out there. Um, but the good news is you're not in this alone. Um, there are counselors like us here to help guide you through that process and there's Education USA. So um, we're just taking a top level look at all of this today and, and we hope that we just give you a quick snapshot to get you started on your own search. The next type of institution um, in the US is Fine Arts Colleges, also known as Arts Conservatories, depending on the type of institute. But this is, as it, the name suggests, it's focused for students um, who are going into the arts. That can be visual or performing arts. So whether you are a visual artist into painting, drawing, sculpting, ceramics, photography, design, or performing artist, maybe a, an instrumental musician, a vocalist, a dancer, or into theater, um, this type of institute would be for those who are looking to, who already have a foundation in the arts and are looking to expand on those skills. So these are very specialized institutions. They tend to have um, quite high admission standards and very specific admission criteria for entry. So in the application process, um, some of the things you might encounter as part of the application criteria would be a portfolio review, especially if you are going into the visual arts, you may need to submit a portfolio of maybe 10 to 20 pieces of your visual work. So whether that's sketches or designs you have made, um, any type of visual art, you would uh, put that together in the portfolio and submit that as part of the application. In other cases, you may be required to audition 
This um, could certainly be the case if you are going into performing arts, whether as a musician, an instrumentalist, or going into theater or dance, you may need to participate in a live audition that could be virtual or potentially in person. Um, and you may also need to provide uh, a video or a highlight reel of your best performances to submit as part of that application process. And then in both cases, oftentimes there are interviews as well. Um, as they're narrowing down the top picks of the applicants, they may choose to do an interview with you. Um, and that could be with a, a one individual from the admissions office, or it could even be a panel interview with um, members from the faculty of your program. So I want you to be prepared for that, but also don't be intimidated by that process um, because fine arts colleges are so specialized. Uh, it's kind of going back to that selectivity aspect that Rashad was talking about. Um, these institutes are looking for the best of the best students in most cases who have um, strong background in performing and visual arts. So if that sounds like you, if you're a person who has already been pursuing these and you want to continue your education, um, I would encourage you to look at fine arts colleges and institutes in the United States. As far as your classes and coursework when you are enrolled in these programs, um, it's going to focus on a kind of a hybrid learning model. So of course you'll focus on your arts specialty by taking courses within the program and the arts focus that you are enrolled in, but you'll also get a foundational liberal arts education um, that's interdisciplinary and allows you to pursue career paths outside of your arts discipline as well. So it could be foundational courses in business, for example, or finance or economics alongside your art specialty courses. So some institutes, just for an example in the US that would be considered fine arts college would be the Rhode Island School of Design, the Savannah College of Art and Design, Minneapolis College of Art and Design, and of course, Juilliard, which um, is well known for, for its performing arts. So those are just a few examples, um, but there's many more institutes out there. If you are um, doing your Google search and just looking for fine arts colleges, you'll be able to narrow down that list. Now, in other to these um, uh, educational uh, institutions, there's also institutes of technology. And my colleague touched briefly and gave you some examples of institutes of technology in the United States, very famous ones. But let's understand together what are they exactly. So institutes of technology are one of like kind of like one of the most exciting um, like uh, new kind of like institutions. A lot of students find them to be very interesting and like more focused uh, on or, more, or oriented based on the on the type of the uh, the the skills uh, the skill set that those institutions are actually focusing on. So a lot of them also a lot of people see them as some sort of collaboration between um, like employers and, and colleges and universities uh, where they work together to deliver some sort of uh, high quality technical education to these students. And we do see um, different examples, uh, very advanced on uh, kind of like courses offered or programs focusing mostly on manufacturing, for example, cybersecurity, agri-tech, and many, many more. So uh, the advantages of being in these, um, or, or the difference if we look at first, like of, of attending these kind of institutions, um, we could like probably main three different differences. Um, and for example, they would bring uh, together colleges and universities and, and working together to develop skills um, business would need in technology or, or cybersecurity or in, uh, in, in some sort of like uh, focus, for example, if we look at the NYIT, for example, they're known for their um, their architecture, for example. Uh, so the another difference as well would be like students of these in kind of institutions have access to world class courses um, and, and cutting edge uh, kind of facilities uh, based on what that institution is really well known for or focusing on. And I mentioned the uh, architecture, for example. Uh, they're also known to be very open to people of all ages 
pages. So there is no limit of getting there um, to these uh, kind of institutions are looking to develop more the technical skills for these students. So basically uh, the curriculum is very generally focused on STEM uh, subjects and um, they do apply like learning through labs, research and a lot of hands-on. And they also a very new one for providing easy access to internships um, and, and co-ops uh, opportunities. Uh, with this, I'll hand it to my colleague. All right, so uh, here to talk to you about uh, research universities, large public research institutions. Uh, so um, the large public ins institutions in the United States um, many times are uh, state schools, uh, some uh, state schools that you might uh, know of, maybe like University of Michigan or uh, Ohio State University or University of California system as a whole. Um, but a lot of these uh, uh, top tier, you know, research institutions are going to give you exactly what you uh, what the name suggests. Um, there's going to be a high level of research at these institutions. Uh, some of them can be known for science uh, based um, research. Some of them can be learned with, known for, let's say, psychology or business or many others. So again, uh, going back to kind of that program um, slide that we kind of talked about, uh, you definitely want to, if you're looking to go to a, a highly um, uh, high research institution, then you definitely want to uh, make sure that you have a, a good idea of which kinds of um, majors are going to be highly represented in a research institution. Now, um, part of the thing that we kind of talk about when we talk about um, large public research institutions uh, is the fact that they uh, are going to also have uh, more affordable tuition. Um, many of these public universities are going to have um, um, a lot of money coming in from like state government, the federal government. So that allows some of the large public research institutions to, um, to have uh, affordable tuition for uh, many of their, the, the in-state students. Um, some students uh, or some universities have um, um, varying um, uh, out of state or international uh, tuition, uh, but that's definitely something that uh, they're, they're kind of known for uh, as well. Um, a diverse student body, that's another thing is they're all, always known for too. And I would say this is not exclusive to uh, large public research institutions. It definitely matters where the, the institution is in the United States because the United States is a huge place. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of different variety, uh, not only for your majors and things like that, but also for diversity and the types of diversity uh, that are specific to that region of the United States where that school is, is located. Uh, we kind of talked a, a little bit about the, the research component, uh, going back to it really quickly, just having the access to top research top researchers and many many times that's going to take um, the uh, the shape of the professors who are going to be teaching at that that college so again if you do want to do um, uh, or be involved in a highly or high research field maybe that there's something that you have identified in the time that you uh, have been uh, in high school maybe you've already started on a research program um, th this might be something that is going to be very uh, important to you and having the access to some of these top researchers some of these the the labs that some of those top researchers are actually using some of these state-of-the-art labs um, that they're, they're going to be using as well so uh, that's something that you definitely want to take under consideration many researchers are they end up obviously being published uh, and they go on to to make us uh, like um, uh, COVID-19, you know, um, vaccines and, you know, other things. If you're going to go into science fields, if you are looking into the impact of social media on, um, on wellness, uh, that might be something that you want to research as well. Uh, so you want to uh, have these opportunities to be able to uh, do some of the graduate uh, research level as well. So you, uh, if you want to be, uh, if you want to get like, say, your PhD or a master's uh, degree, uh, some of these uh, pub public research institutions are going to be um, one of the first places that you're going to, to look to be able to get some of the, uh, the, the access to um, some of these types of research um, programs and opportunities. Um, 
you also kind of take a look at uh, the amount of um, degree programs. Uh, many uh, large public research institutions uh, have a large breadth of um, different majors and programs. Uh, some of them have up to 300 uh, research uh, um, uh, like uh, um, programs that students are able to access. Uh, it's very uh, very common for students to move between programs. So uh, if you have 300 to kind of um, kind of take a look at, uh, then you have a little bit of that, uh, that opportunity uh, to be able to kind of switch between any different majors. The last thing I'll say as well is um, a large athletic program. So if you are someone who plays uh, a, a football or a baseball or uh, any things like that, then you have also access to uh, a lot of different athletic events or a lot of athletic programs at the same time. So uh, many times these, uh, these uh, athletic programs you can get scholarships from if you are at a very, very, very high level, uh, say like playing for the, your state team or the Olympic team of, of your uh, country, uh, things like that. Uh, so you do have some of the opportunities to play for some of the uh, athletic programs as well. Great. So now let's talk about uh, liberal arts um, colleges or liberal arts education. So there are many uh, subjects or many programs that fall um, within this category of typical liberal arts degree uh, program. So that, which means like they're all like interdisciplinary uh, covering topics within like humanities, social, natural and formal sciences. So there are differences definitely in the particular uh, subjects included in the liberal arts degree programs at different institutions, but uh, most of um, they are generally accepted are covering the following fields, which are humanities, which include like art, literature, linguistics, philosophy, religions, and if you look at social uh, sciences, it would include history, psychology, law, econ economics, natural science would include astronomy, biology, chemistry, physics, and then the uh, other sciences like mathematics and statistics, et cetera. But the, um, the term uh, liberal arts education uh, can also like be applied to the uh, kind of like, we we'll call it like dedicated study of just one of like the, um, the, the types of subjects I mentioned earlier. For example, if a student is studying a BA in philosophy, um, that could be said to be like, undertaking liberal arts education. Um, in general, however, the, the, these terms offer, uh, refers to degrees, degrees that um, aim to provide a broader like spectrum of knowledge and skills. So um, liberal degree programs are mostly common in the United States. There are hundreds of um, dedicated like college program, liberal arts colleges in the United States. Um, and and they, they do provide what's called like a BA or, or bachelor's of science, but you do get a broader um, like uh, education, which prepares you very well and also provide you with that hands-on interdisciplinary, uh, but they tend to be like very holistic when you apply to them. Uh, and they tend to be also uh, smaller um, in size. Uh, with this, I'll, to my colleague. So next, we're going to go briefly over um, some um, admissions uh, opportunities for you, um, starting with the regular admissions application cycle. Um, so if, when you are applying to an institution in the United States, you'll want to take a look at what their requirements are as far as their admission cycle. Um, so starting with regular admissions, um, which is a could be described as the most popular, where applications are closed and reviewed, um, uh, and they're all based on a specific date. So you'll need to be aware of that specific date. Um, so let's just throw out a random um, time frame, right? So if, if the application deadline is um, January 31st, you'll need to make sure that you've applied 
well in advance and that you have submitted all of your documents by that date. So that's what we're referring to when we're talking about regular admissions and just being overall aware that each institution is different. And we're gonna talk next about all of the different application cycles um, that you might, um, you might experience when you're applying to multiple universities in the United States. So next is uh, rolling admissions. So uh, this is uh, definitely one of the most common uh, admissions um, um, admissions uh, uh, area here. Um, as far as rolling admissions, generally what this is going to, uh, it, to indicate is that uh, the applications are going to be reviewed uh, and, uh, and, and submitted when the student actually goes through um, go through goes through and submits the application. So if uh, if you um, for example, if you are going to submit your application uh, very, very early, say like in uh, September, then that means that you are probably going to get an admissions decision earlier in that cycle. You might end up getting it um, almost immediately or you might end up getting it uh, after a specific date. But if you um, if you are submitting your application, say, in um, in January or something like that, um, then you might end up getting it um, just like that next month. But that um, that specific university is going to be uh, reviewing those applications kind of just as they come in, uh, as we say, on a rolling uh, basis. Uh, so uh, and they'll, uh, that specific university will go through all of those applications through the uh, entire cycle, generally ending on May 1st. All right, so the, <clears throat> excuse me. So the next um, application type is called open admissions. So basically what open admissions is, it's the most flexible form where if you meet the minimum entry requirements that are advertised by the institution, then you're guaranteed admission to that school. Now there's many different examples of schools um, practicing open admissions. A main part of them are community colleges where again, if you meet the minimum requirement, um, you go to, then you can get admission. And so basically the point of open admission is really to give access to students uh, to universities and colleges. And it makes the guessing of getting into an institution a lot more transparent. Um, so one thing that we always advocate for students or recommend for students is to diversify um, and apply broadly to universities. And one type of university that we do recommend that students apply to is open admission because you don't want to be in a situation at the end of the application cycle that you didn't get any offers you're on the or you're on the wait list for highly selective institutions it's always good to have an open admissions institution for you to apply to just in case but you know open admissions doesn't mean that the institution is less than quality it doesn't mean that it's less popular this is just a way for universities to accept students because they're able to support students on an open admissions basis. So um, a lot of great opportunities, a lot of universities have to practice this as well. And definitely when you're looking at the admissions requirements, it's a very appropriate question to ask. What is your admission standards and is it open admissions that if I meet the minimal, will I be guaranteed admission to that school? Great. So another type of decisions that no one for uh, U.S. institutions is called um, early decision. So um, it's this kind of like um, decision is mostly considered to be very restrictive um, and it mostly um, uh, provided by in, in highly selective institutions. So what does that mean? So early applications review acceptance is very biting which means like a student who is accepted as an early decision applicant must attend the college. So in the United States, there are over uh, there are a lot of institutions and colleges that actually do um, provide early decision as well as early action, as my colleague is going to talk about this later. But early decisions, if we look at them, it's also known as ED, uh, they plan to have like and they're like some students would find them to be like unfair some students will will be really like uh find them to be uh but you don't have to go for them it's just like a way for you to get decision early and that's kind of one of the benefits um so when students get the decisions early um they get to they 
they have to apply early, of course, but they receive an admission decision from the college well in advance of the usual notification date. So usually by December, um, students will have to agree to attend the college if accepted and offered financial aid package that is considered um, like uh, good to the family, uh, apply to only one college early decision and apply to other colleges and the regular admission plans, if that has to be. And then, um, of course, so the uh, who should apply if we think if we ask who should apply for for these kind of um, early decision. So research colleges mostly do that. Some some of them. Uh, so so a lot of students also would like uh, would have an academic record that has been consistently solid over the time. Can apply for these kind of uh, or students that meet or exceed the, the, the admissions uh, profile of how the selective colleges would, would be able to apply for this. And I leave it to my colleague to talk about the other version, uh, which is the early action. Great, thanks, Yusi. So early action is a little bit different than early decision in that you still apply early to university or college. You get an admission decision a little bit earlier, but it is non-binding. So with the early decision, if you are admitted to that institution, you are required to enroll in that institution. So it's a binding contract or agreement with that university or college. Um, whereas early action just allows you to apply to an earlier deadline um, for fall admission. The application deadlines for most early action institutions falls between November 1st or November 15th. So if you're applying by that deadline, you should be receiving an early admission decision early in the next year, um, probably by January or so. Um, and so with that, you just know a little bit sooner than maybe other institutions you have applied to of if you are accepted or not. And that can really help you make your plans for where you want to enroll. So the earlier you apply, the earlier you get your admission decisions and the earlier you can begin planning your next steps to enroll in the US um, in higher education system. Now, some of the benefits with both early decision, like UC mentioned, and early action is financial aid and scholarship packages. So oftentimes there are more scholarship opportunities that could be available for students who apply to early um, decision and early action deadlines. So that would be something in your research process to identify what those deadlines are and what the scholarship opportunities are for you as well. Um, so that when you are accepted, you can make a, an informed decision of the um, based on the financial aid package or scholarship package that you might be awarded. And I'll turn it over for the next type of admissions uh, to Tara. Sorry, sorry for the delay. Um, so next, I'm going to mention the gap year. Maybe you've heard of this term before. Um, this is the year that um, students sometimes decide to take um, maybe a bit of a break um, between their high school education and um, coming to a university. So um, it's a process when a student um, is admitted and chooses to enroll for a future term. Um, and so during this gap year, um, students often choose to travel, um, but they can. there are lots of reasons why students um, might take that gap year. Maybe there are um, family reasons, um, financial reasons. Uh, there could be multiple reasons why students take a gap year. Um, so this is becoming a more common practice among um, students and universities are recognizing that students often want to have this flexibility. Um, so keep that in mind if you feel like um, this might be something you want to pursue. Uh, many universities are recognizing uh, the gap year and will offer you that admission um, even if it's a year later. So that's why we thought it was important to mention this in the presentation. All right, so, uh, and then uh, lastly, we're gonna talk about uh, holistic uh, comprehensive review. So this seems like a really big term, right? So um, holistic uh, comprehensive review um, merely kind of takes under consideration like a comprehensive um, uh, process when they are reviewing your application. So 
Um, many of you know um, that if you get good grades, then that's going to uh, definitely take be a great thing for you to be able to apply to uh, some great colleges and things like that, and maybe get scholarships and, and other things. So, um, or, so grades are just one of the part, uh, one piece of the puzzle uh, when we are taking into consideration a, a, a college or university that has a holistic, comprehensive review process when admitting students. So grades, uh, you're going to be taking a look at test scores. That might be your um, your SAT, your ACT. Um, as well. Um, that can also be like uh, personal statements um, of um, that, you, that you maybe you have submitted collected from uh, people that, um, that that know you that are uh, saying that you're a good person or that you're a smart person or that you uh, kind of talk about a little things of things about you um, and why you might be a good fit for the college. Um, that also might be, I'm sorry, that was letters of recommendation. <laughs> so um, that also might be uh, uh, essays at the same time, uh, things that uh, a student has, uh, uh, an essay that a student has written kind of talking about their strengths and uh, things like that. Uh, or, and then also personal statement kind of goes in with essays. So that might be something that uh, you would be required to, uh, to write or to submit as a part of your application. Uh, sometimes the personal st statement or essay can be assigned by a college, uh, so you might talk about uh, if, the, if you want to go into like an area like biology or something like that, you might be assigned uh, an essay or a personal statement or um, a kind of a, a subject to be able to write so that that college can put that under consideration for their uh, comprehensive review um, admission standards. So uh, these are all things that a college is going to take under consideration. Definitely grades is going to be one of the things that is going to be heavily rated. Uh, you can't just have like very average grades, but then write a great essay and think that you're going to get into college. However, this, uh, this holistic comprehensive review does take under consideration all of these different areas and probably a little bit more uh, for some colleges and universities uh, to be able to review your application. So uh, right now we're going to go into a little bit more of um, information about our specific colleges and university. Uh, so I will uh, go to Liz first to talk about Minnesota State Mankato. Thanks Rashad. So again, I'm from Minnesota State University Mankato um, and thinking about the type of institution we are, we are a public university. Um, and as a public institution, we actually have many different types of programs available. A lot of our programs are have a foundation of liberal arts education through our general education course requirements. So all students, regardless of what program you're studying, whether you're going into business, engineering, sciences, healthcare, or arts and humanities, um, you'll take similar foundation courses um, through our general education curriculum. That's part of, that's found, has a foundation in liberal arts education. Um, we, as a public university, we are considered a mid-sized institution. We enroll around 14,000 students on our campus, and we have representation from 97 different countries um, through our international students. And students have the opportunity to pursue more than 130 bachelor degree programs. Um, and many of our undergraduate students do stay on or come back to us to pursue master's programs. And we have around 80 master's and doctoral programs that you can choose from. Um, as far as our admission requirements, we have what my colleague Chris was talking about that open admission or guaranteed admission practice. So our admission requirements um, are clearly stated on our application. And as long as you meet the minimum requirements based on your academic grades, as well as your English proficiency results, you are guaranteed admission to the university. And we are also test optional, which means we do not require a university or college entrance exam for admission. So the SAT or the SAT, um, is not required uh, in addition to other university entrance exams. Um, as far as our scholarships, international students who are accepted as an undergraduate student are um, receive a guaranteed scholarship upon admission. This is called the International Maverick Scholarship. It's applied to students um, for the first year towards their tuition. It's currently valued at $7,420 per year. And it's a renewable scholarship that you can receive each year, as long as you meet the minimum 
requirements based on your grades, um, as well as the volunteer requirements. So there's an aspect of community service and volunteerism to maintain that scholarship, which encourages our international students to get involved on campus as well as in the community. And it's been a great resource for many students on campus um, to learn more about Mankato and about the Minnesota community as, in general. As far as opportunities to get involved, um, we have more than 200 student clubs and organizations. There's opportunities as well for undergraduate research, fellowships, and also study abroad opportunities too. Um, we have quite a few of our international students who are coming to Minnesota State Mankato, who also choose to participate in our education abroad um, programs outside of the United States, as well as within the US. And then of course, through many of our programs, there's opportunities for internships, um, as well as career placement after graduation through both curricular practical training and optional practical training or OPT. Um, so that's a very brief overview of Minnesota State Mankato. So if you have any questions, please let me know. Um, otherwise I will turn it over to my colleague. Thank you. Uh, so um, Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University is a very unique and specialized institution. We're the largest aviation and aerospace university in the world. Um, what also makes us pretty unique is we offer two campus locations. You'll see in the top right hand corner of the map of the United States, you'll see that we have a campus in Daytona Beach, Florida, and also a campus in Prescott, Arizona. So really it will be up to you on where you wanna study. Uh, Daytona Beach, Florida is a lovely campus located just about 10 minutes from the beach in a subtropical climate, um, which means that our weather um, is generally pretty warm um, and uh, pretty beautiful throughout the year, um, making for a great opportunity for students who are interested in flight training um, to work on their flight throughout the year. With that said, our Prescott, Arizona campus also offers um, amazing weather for uh, flight training. Um, the difference is um, Prescott, Arizona is located in the beautiful mountains, um, just about an hour and a half north of Phoenix. And um, the Prescott campus offers all four seasons. So you will experience um, winter and um, potentially even snow from time to time. Lots of great outdoor activities um, in Arizona, um, anything from um, you know, mountain biking, um, uh, mountain climbing, bouldering, um, lots of different um, outdoor activities. So two very unique campuses, two very different geographic um, regions in the United States with different climates. Um, but more importantly, I think we should talk about the programs at Embry-Riddle. As I mentioned um, earlier, we when we talked about STEM uh, universities, Embry-Riddle would be considered a, a STEM specialized university offering over 70 different degree programs within the STEM fields. So um, we're probably most well known for aerospace engineering and aeronautical science, which is our flight program. Um, it's a four year program that combines your flight training with your academics. But with that said, we offer uh, business administration, electrical engineering, um, astronomy um, and astrophysics. Uh, communications, meteorology. So we, we offer many different degree programs. So you don't, um, if maybe, maybe you're kind of interested in aviation, but you're not really sure what exactly you want to do with it. Um, like I said, over 70 different degree programs to choose from. We are happy to say that our class sizes generally um, average about 25 students per class. So um, you will have small classroom sizes at both of our residential campuses in the United States. So um, that will have you feeling um, really a part of the Embry-Riddle community. We have a really amazing international student population on our campus. Um, at both of our residential campuses, um, we have students representing over 100 different uh, countries around the world. So you, you certainly won't be the only international student at Embry-Riddle. Um, at both of our campuses, we offer an international um, student programming council or, or group or club that gets together and uh, schedules activities so that you can be really a part of the community and um, get to know students from other countries um, and certainly interact with students here in the United States as well while exploring um, different parts of the campus and also the surrounding areas. 
We're really proud of our placement rate of over 94%. Um, what that means is that within one year of graduating, our students are finding jobs within their field. Um, and that's really exciting because obviously the end goal is um, finding a job after you graduate. Um, the unique thing about studying in the United States is that our universities usually offer um, a, a department called career services or career planning. Um, and that is an opportunity for you to utilize the services um, on our campuses to help you find jobs. Um, Elizabeth mentioned earlier CPT and OPT, the opportunities to work as an intern um, utilizing CPT or the opportunity to work in the United States under OPT or optional practical training after you graduate. So keep in mind that's offered um, at all of our universities and um, it's a great way to build your resume and um, gain some experience before heading back to your home country. Um, and just finally, just some interesting um, accolades, um, you know, Embry-Riddle, um, we've had over, um, I think nine of our alum have gone on to become astronauts. Um, we've been the first college of security and intelligence in the nation um, and had high rankings in our aerospace engineering program. So if you're interested in learning more about Embry-Riddle, um, certainly you can reach out to me after the presentation um, and we'll be happy to assist. Thanks. Hello everyone, my name, uh, again, my name is Yusef and I'm the Assistant Director of Admissions here at Northwestern University in Qatar campus. So Northwestern University has two campuses. The main campus is in the US in Illinois, in Vincent. And um, we have a branch campus in Qatar where I'm currently located. So founded in 1851 um, in Illinois, in Evanston, and in Doha in 2008. So here in Doha, it's uh, almost uh, 500 students that we have. All of them are international students. Um, number of countries represented are all over 60 countries represented here. And the student to faculty ratio is 12 to one. So ranked in the top 25 universities worldwide by the Times uh, Higher Education in the United States and also top nine by US uh, news and world report. So Northwestern University in Qatar provides a framework for students to, um, to shape their future through its um, distinguished or remarkable schools of journalism and communication and also liberal arts. So we are a private institution. Uh, our branch in Qatar being part of the vision by the Qatar Foundation that brought all uh, five uh, elite uh, institutions to what's called Education City. And uh, every institution to part of um, like is taking care of one uh, program or one college or two colleges. And they're all offered here in one campus. You will literally live in a campus of U elite US institutions um, and live in all sharing and, and you could like have a major with us here and do minor at Cornell or, or Carnage uh, or Texas A&M and so on and so forth. So with majors in communication and journalism and minors with power in universities in, in education city. So all students take a variety of courses across many disciplines um, in, in humanities, uh, social sciences. Uh, so here uh, we offer, as I said, like Bachelor of Science in Communication and Bachelors of Science in Journalism and Strategic Communication, also liberal arts programs. These programs are great academic foundation for uh, for individual interested in the full like like uh, media, film, corporate communication, health, uh, sports communication, and sports management, as well as journalism, public relations, and marketing and advertising. Uh, so we are. Uh, we provide all the facilities here. Uh, we are also considered, or Qatar as a country is considered a, um, a media or hub, uh, and a lot of resources are offered here, and a lot of uh, internships are provided to our students through Washington Post. There we have students who uh, are interning or entered uh, with uh, big media outlets like Al Jazeera, Fox News, and uh, we are also uh, hosting the World Cup very soon. And uh, there's a lot of internships out of our students that I get involved in with Fox Sports right now and, and other uh, media uh, outlets. In terms of, uh, in terms of uh, scholarships, 
uh, we do also uh, offer uh, grants or scholarship by the Northwestern University, and we also offer what's called uh, financial aid by the Qatar Foundation. The financial aid uh, that is offered by uh, the Qatar Foundation is literally general and uh, can meet up to full uh, demonstrated need. Um, so uh, we we are still accepting applications. We're also test optional. We do uh, not require the SAT or SAT. Uh, students um, would need to provide us with an English proficiency test through either TOEFL, IELTS, or Duolingo. Um, and uh, we are currently, we're also doing um, early action and regular decision at the same time. The early action applications has already passed and decisions have been already uh, shared, uh, but we are still now accepting students um, based on a regular decision and uh, March 1st is uh, the deadline. Uh, this is a short overview and uh, we'll be very happy to talk to you uh, privately later if you have any questions about Northwestern in Qatar. Uh, to you, my friend. All right, so I'm here to talk about Orange Coast College in California. So my name is Christopher Turibio. I'm the Assistant Director for admission, International Admissions for my college. And just to kind of tie in our presentation in relation to our school. So Orange Coast College is a two-year community college. And as a two-year community college, we specialize in the first two years of your undergraduate degree. And in specializing in the first two years of your undergraduate degree, many of the programs that we do offer is really focused on liberal arts like we talked about before. In fact, liberal arts is the foundation of the US higher education model to ensure that students have a well-rounded education. And at every university and college in the US, you'll pursue liberal arts, but because we specialize in the first two years of your undergraduate education, the liberal arts actually comes in the first two years. Um, but community colleges, including Orange Coast College, has a wealth and a wealth of programs that we offer. So you can basically study anything at a community college. In fact, we have programs um, in the visual and performing arts, in the technical specialized schools, at the research universities and the liberal arts colleges. Um, so Orange Coast College is considered a large, comprehensive and high performing community college. We're located in Costa Mesa, California, which is between Los Angeles in San Diego. We're also one of the largest host community colleges for international students. And we have international students from more than 100 different countries. And here's some of our examples of some of our international students um, that have started at OCC or their journey at OCC, uh, majoring in many different types of majors and programs, and moving on to really, you know, great schools that fits their, you know, academic goals and also their financial need. Um, and one thing about Orange Coast College when we're looking at transfer is that we really want to provide diversified transfer options to our students because many of our students are interested in many different programs and again have many different areas, many different types of financial need that they would need in order for them to transfer. Um, but one fun fact about Orange Coast College is that we invested about $700 million in our campus during the pandemic. Um, so as we reopen for the spring semester, we have a lot of new buildings and facilities for our students and the construction is continuing and one of our construction projects that completed in 2020 is our on campus student housing. In fact, we're the only community college in Southern California with on campus student housing. Okay. Um, so again, you can pursue any major at Orange Coast College, you can transfer to any university. Um, that you choose at the community at the community colleges, including Orange Coast. You can earn scholarships as a transfer student as well. And if you want more information about OCC, um, go on our social media. So follow us on Instagram at OCC Internationals, which is the central hub of our latest updates and information. We have many different, we have three application intakes, the summer, spring, and fall. And one of the biggest benefits of coming to community colleges is that we're very flexible when it comes to admission. No SAT nor ACT required. We just need you to provide proof of your English proficiency, meet our minimum score, and your guaranteed admission. And if you want to know what it's like to be a student at OCC, um, one of my former students from India, Nan, has a YouTube channel documenting his experience as an international student in the United States at a community college. And ultimately, he transferred to a university in Texas where he earned a full financial aid and um, academic scholarship to attend his studies. He's currently in Spain doing a study abroad. So subscribe to his channel for more information. 
And thank you so much. And I will we'll go a little bit to my, a little south to my neighbor at the University of California, Irvine. Thank you so much. Appreciate that, Chris. Uh, so yes, my name is Rashad with uh, University of California, Irvine. Uh, we are a part of the UC system with other uh, UC campuses, say like in, in Los Angeles and, and others. Uh, however, uh, UCI, we are a public university, a public state university. Um, we have um, a ranking of, of, uh, of public schools in the United States of uh, number nine. Uh, so definitely a great school um, to, uh, to, to come to if you are studying um, some majors such as computer science, game design, uh, business as well. Um, but uh, you, you have a lot of opportunities to, uh, to, to get different internships, uh, and study many other majors as well. Uh, we have about 150 major, majors and minors at the undergraduate level. Um, uh, very small class sizes for a uh, public research institution. Uh, 18 to one is our student to equity ratio. Uh, so you definitely have some opportunities to uh, definitely make some connections with your professors. Uh, if they're doing research, you can have the opportunity to assist them with doing research, or you may even get a professor to uh, get get um, get you to uh, help with um, their the research that maybe a, an undergraduate, another undergraduate is uh, is doing as well. Uh, we're located in Irvine, California, which is uh, just south of uh, Los Angeles, just about ten minutes south of uh, Chris's campus at OCC. Uh, Irvine is, uh, has been rated uh, one of the safest cities in the United States of its size, which is around 200,000 residents. Um, the total enrollment of, uh, of, of, of people who attend UCI is about 36,000. About 7,000, almost 7,000 of those uh, students are international students. Uh, so definitely we have a, a very large international population that attends UCI. Uh, more than uh, 90 uh, countries represented um, on our campus. Uh, and we have about 200,000 uh, people who have graduated from UCI, gone on to become alumni. Um, and some of those um, have been um, have, have now been uh, awarded Nobel Prizes. We have three uh, who have been awarded, um, uh, who, who are alumni who have been awarded um, who, uh, in chemistry and then also one in physics. So uh, this is kind of indicative of some of the, um, the types of professors that are going to be also teaching in some of your courses. Uh, again, people who have, have done um, some, uh, some great research uh, in their respective fields. Um, one thing that we're very proud of as well is our graduation rate. So you coming in as a, a first-time freshman, um, uh, there's a 73% chance that you are gonna graduate within four years uh, from our university. So uh, that's definitely something very to be very proud of as a student that actually uh, um, give, puts you in a situation where you have the opportunity to save yourself a lot of money uh, say if you uh, wanted to be um, to graduate in that four years time, that means that you don't have to pay a fifth year or a sixth year uh, of tuition at our university as well. So um, if you want to get a little bit more information about UCI, you can go to admissions.uci.edu. Uh, and then we'll also go to the next slide and you'll be able to get all of our my contact information, but also all of our contact information at the same time. Uh, so if you would like to screen shot this um, this slide here you'll be able to get a nice uh, view of our smiling faces as well as our uh, email addresses and which institution we uh, represent uh, if you want to get more information specifically about Scott over about uh, Pepperdine you can also take his information too and reach out uh, since he was not able to join but uh, this is all of our information here so we uh, will open this up for a bit more uh, um, uh, questions and answers, things like that. You can also uh, type in any of the, the different questions that you have uh, into the chat and we'd love to, um, to answer any of your questions. much. Um, thank you, everyone, uh, for this valuable session. Um, all the details you mentioned today are very important to the potential students who are following us, and um, we received really interesting questions. So I'd like to remind everyone that a recorded version of this webinar would be available on our Facebook page and on our YouTube channel as well, because I kept receiving um, this question a lot. So uh, I'm going to start uh, with the first question that we received here from the Zoom. 
Um, so it's coming from uh, Ahmed, and um, he said, could you please talk a little bit more about conditional admission? Um, so uh, he said, well, he explained that the Ministry of Higher Education requires official admission to complete the process of the scholarship application because some Libyans receive um, governmental scholarships, okay? So uh, the ministry requires them to provide a conditional admission. So could any one of you, um, you know, maybe provide more details about this? Thank you. Sure, I can start and then any of my colleagues can add if, if there's something I forgot. Conditional admission might look a little bit different at each college or university as far as the requirements, but essentially it means that the student um, has submitted enough application materials, such as their academic um, grades and transcripts, as well as maybe English proficiency and maybe some of the other app required application materials, but it's possible that their application is not 100% complete but there's enough information there to base a conditional admission decision, meaning that upon receiving um, completed application materials, that student is accepted. So without, um, unless something drastically changes in the final uh, application transcripts or other documents that the student might provide, that student is otherwise accepted to the university. They just have not yet received full acceptance. So oftentimes with that conditional admission, an institution will provide a letter saying the student is conditionally accepted upon meeting all of the admission, admission criteria. Um, so assuming they meet those criteria, they'll be receive that letter and then they can use that letter to apply for additional funding. Um, for example, through the Libyan government scholarship program. So I, if a student is in that situation, I would encourage them to contact the admission counselor um, at the school or university that they're applying to, let them know the terms of the conditional admission requirement for that funding, and the admission counselor can advise them through that process. Um, so that's, that's general information about how it might work. The details will change from institution to institution, um, but if any of my colleagues have anything to add to that, please do. Yeah, that's, that's actually really good um, information. And um, just wanted to add that when you're looking at the application timeline, uh, specifically for the US, um, you're typically going to apply while you're still attending school. Um, so when you are receiving an admission decision, it is considered conditional or what's called provisional upon submitting your final grades. So please keep that in mind that even though you did receive an admission offer, the university and college is still going to require, let's say, your final transcript or finalized information to give you a full decision um, from your application. Now, that doesn't mean that you can't do anything to help onboard. So while you have your provisionally admitted, you can apply for scholarships, like Liz mentioned. You can apply for housing as well and other services that you would need to fully prepare for your arrival. Uh, but just because you receive an admission letter, it's not finalized until, again, your final grades are going to be submitted to the institution. So my next question is coming from uh, Jeanette, and um, she said, I'll probably um, uh, only be able to do a part-time course. So is this possible for international students? So again, I can add to that. Um, so a lot of institutions are moving further and further in the direction of offering fully online degrees. Many colleges and universities already do, um, both at the bachelor level and at the master's or doctoral level. So the, the thing that international students need to consider when thinking about an online program is they cannot study that online program from within the United States. Um, they are not eligible to receive a student visa to study um, in the US. So they would be taking that program online abroad, either in their home country or maybe the country that they're currently living in um, to pursue that degree. Now, most institutions that offer online programs are able to, to deliver those programs internationally. So they're not restricted um, to, to students from anywhere in the world can take those programs, but certainly they might have different admission criteria still for international applicants to online programs. So um, I would say, yes, it's very accessible for international students to take online programs from home, but they should speak with an admission counselor um, to find out the criteria for admission. 
and also find out about the feasibility of taking that online program from home. If it's a program that requires you to be in person attending class at a specific time, those times are not always convenient for those who are living abroad. So they might be waking up in the middle of the night to attend classes. Homework assignments might be due um, on weekends or, or at odd times. Um, and so they really need to consider if, if that's a good fit for their education. Definitely, yeah, it requires a lot of flexibility, correct. Okay, so uh, thank you. Uh, so I have another question now, uh, and I believe that it's gonna go to Tara or Karen, because uh, it's about aviation. So I have a, I have a student who asked me about um, the requirements um, to uh, get a degree in aviation in the United States, because it's you know, a little bit um, complicated, and it could be different from a country to another. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so if you're choosing to study in the United States um, and you want to study aviation, you'll be working on your FAA licenses. Um, and if you also are coming to the United States and maybe you already have um, aviation licenses outside of the United States, there is a way to convert licenses. Um, so keep that in mind. And, and that goes both ways. So let's say you decide to study in the United States um, and you work on your FAA licenses and then you go home um, to your home country, you can convert those licenses to your home country as well. So um, I hope that answers your question. Definitely um, reach out to us for any specific questions about aviation. We'll be happy to help. Thank you. So I have another question from um, the Facebook page. Uh, it's coming from Asma, and it's a really good question. So she said, um, what are the pros of going to HBCU? Because you know HBCU term could be um, something new for international students. So what are the advantages of getting a degree from an HBCU? I guess I'll take, uh, take this one. So, um... Just to be clear, UCI is not a HBCU, but um, but as far as um, um, the entire uh, the term and, and the HBCUs were uh, were founded in the United States uh, as a re reaction to um, some of the social issues that um, with, with people of color uh, in the United States. So um, the, uh, the the purpose, the advantage uh, is definitely to be able to be surrounded by, uh, by people that, are, that look like you. Um, there's a, definitely a social uh, aspect of being able to, um, to, to be able to do that. And some of the students that, that go have the opportunity to study uh, just like everyone else uh, and some of the top majors and with research um, and also uh, financial ability as well. Uh, but it is definitely uh, an opportunity uh, that's very, very unique, I think, in, in all of education, because uh, I think that the, the historically, historically Black colleges and universities um, is uh, definitely something that um, mainly exists in the United States, but there are uh, hundreds of different uh, historically Black uh, colleges in the United States, uh, many in uh, very some Southern states, but you also have some that are in uh, the Northern states of the United States as well. Uh, so that's, uh, um, I would definitely say to, uh, as with any college uh, or university that you're going to be taking a look at, um, number one, uh, is research the college just like you would um, in any other, uh, any other college. Also look at some of the finances that are available, scholarships, the strengths of the programs, things like that. Uh, and then you'll also be able to understand a little bit more information specifically about the founding of that college, uh, that HBCU, uh, and what makes it special at the same time. So, but uh, with anything, definitely do your homework, definitely do your research, because uh, definitely uh, uh, HBCUs hold a special place and special opportunities uh, within the U U.S. Uh, institution and college programs. Thank you so much for your answer. And uh, I'm gonna wrap it up with the last question uh, from the same student. And she's asking about the undergraduate research. So, so she said, um, um, how can I, uh, how, or how, how can undergraduate students do research and what kind of research is available? And also, um, is there like a separate application that we have to submit in order to get research opportunities? Um, I'll, I'll answer this one as well. Um, 
So uh, that's going to definitely, uh, again, kind of going back to what I just got, got finished saying as far as uh, doing your, your own research to, to see like the different uh, opportunities at specific colleges and universities. So um, the, applica the application kind of uh, to do undergraduate research um, or the process, I should say, uh, is gonna be different. Um, sometimes there's going to be uh, the opportunity to, to work directly with your professor. Um, but once you are at university and you start to become uh, a little bit more familiar with uh, some of the things that are going on at the university, uh, some of you'll you'll get the opportunity to to learn about you know how you can undertake some of those. Um, if you're currently doing your own uh, research, that might be a part of your ap actual application uh, and being able to uh, to talk about some of that research. So that might be an avenue for you to be able to do that research. Um, most times, uh, colleges and universities are going to allow you, uh, you to do research at the undergraduate level within like maybe your senior or your junior year, sometimes your sophomore year as well. Um, but you, uh, but but every college is going to have a, diff a, a different system or a different mechanism to be able to allow students to do that. Um, undergraduate research is starting to become very, very common at many colleges and universities. But uh, I take, say this with a grain of salt because you definitely want to come in uh, and be a college student. You know, take your regular classes, understand exactly you know what your interests are. Uh, but you'll you if you want to do research, you'll in, have the opportunity to do that in some of those later undergraduate years, and definitely your master's and, and PhD and, and and so on and so forth. If anyone else wants to uh, kind of chime in on that, uh, definitely do so. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, that's great, Rashad. Um, just wanted to add that you know research opportunities are not just exclusive to research universities. Um, but many universities and colleges, regardless of the type, will have some sort of research opportunity for students. Um, what I typically find with students seeking research opportunities is that they, they, they sign up for the honors program because uh, with the honors program, research is integrated and it's accessible for students. And a lot of it has to do with networking. So um, especially if you're sitting in the classroom with a professor who happens to be a researcher, it's really good to just go ahead and introduce yourself and get to be known within the classroom and also look at other students and also student activities and clubs um, that have connection to research opportunities on your campus. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of opportunities for that, um, even at the first two year level, your freshman and sophomore year. Um, but yes, just you know, they're out there. And it's really just part of the fabric, again, of US education is to ensure that we do provide opportunities to our students that, to apply what they learn in the classroom to like a research opportunity or something a lot more hands-on. All right. Uh, so thank you, everyone, for joining us today um, and for giving this wonderful presentation. Uh, I'm sure this was a very beneficial session for the potential students who are working on, you know, selecting um, U.S. universities. So if you still have, have any specific questions to our um, guest speakers, feel free to reach out to them and keep an eye on our uh, Facebook event. So our upcoming mm -hmm. session is going to be on February 18th about research opportunities for international students with the University of Arizona. So make sure to attend and ask your questions if you're planning to do research in the United States. Um, thank you again for watching today's session and have a wonderful day. Thanks everyone.